She was kidnapped from just in front of her home, and the question still remains, where's Carrie? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Carrie Lawson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Carrie Lawson was 26 years old. She had been born and raised in Jasper, Alabama. She was the daughter of a Tennessee millionaire. She had recently graduated from the University of Alabama's law school. And shortly before this case happened, she had officially taken her bar exam. However, Carrie would never actually find out that she passed the bar exam. Carrie had been married to a man named Earl Lawson. They got married about 18 months prior to this case occurring. I believe he was also in law school. And the two of them had a nice little home in Jasper, Alabama. It was the early morning hours of September 11th, 1991. The phone at the Lawson home rings and Carrie answers it. On the other end is a woman saying that she is a nurse from the Walker Regional Medical Center. This nurse said that Earl's father had just suffered a heart attack and he was at the hospital and that they needed to come there right away. This wasn't something that was like completely shocking to Carrie and Earl because his dad had been having some medical issues over the past few months. And so they're like, okay, this, you know, it sounds accurate. So both Carrie and Earl, they rush to get dressed and they head out of their house and they get into their Ford Explorer. But before they can even really start the car and before Earl can even close the driver's side door, another vehicle pulls up and someone jumps out of it. And this man runs up with a gun and he's also wearing a mask. At first, Earl believed that this was just some super random robbery, that they were just going to demand money. The masked man gives this roll of duct tape to Carrie, and at gunpoint, this assailant forces Carrie to tie up her husband's wrists and legs with the duct tape, which she complies. Then, the assailant at gunpoint takes Carrie, puts her in the Lawson's Ford Explorer. The assailant gets in the driver's side and pulls out of the, the driveway and leaves Earl behind unharmed and they've just kidnapped his wife Carrie. Earl manages to free himself from the duct tape and his keys unfortunately were gone now because they were in the Explorer that was just stolen with his wife and he had, they had locked the house you know, up, and so he had to kick the door down in order to get into his house to call 911. Then he has to make this unfortunate phone call to Carrie's parents, who both still live in Tennessee, stating what just happened, what just transpired. It was just something out of a movie. This could not have just happened, but it did. So the police are immediately involved. Then they contact the FBI, and the FBI comes down to Jasper. They set up a basically a command center in the Lawson house. Carrie's family and relatives from different states, they fly out to Alabama to help in the search. They are all fully expecting this to all have been some crazy situation, but Carrie would be returned very, very soon. That was their hope, but that hope never came true. Not too soon after the kidnapping occurred, they would get a phone call. Uh, Earl got a phone call at the house while the FBI and police were there, and this was a ransom demand. The caller demanded $300,000 in cash in order to safely get Carrie back. Getting that kind of money for this family, especially Carrie's parents, was not a problem. They were able to get $300,000 in cash like that. And so the hope was they would be able to do this drop off of this cash and that they would be able to kind of just hone in on the suspect once they retrieve the money and get this guy. However, the kidnapper did not make this easy whatsoever. The kidnapper would always give these really extreme and complicated instructions. Go to this payphone and then call this number from this payphone. Then I'll tell you where to go next. You call from that payphone, then I'll tell you where to go next. Sometimes the destination was just a couple miles down the road. Other times the next destination was like 20 or 30 miles down the road. The kidnapper specifically asked that Earl's dad, Earl Lawson Sr., 
was the one who should be making the drop off. So initially in this first attempt, that's exactly what they do. Earl Lawson Sr. takes this briefcase full of $300,000 in cash, follows the insanely complicated directions and gets to the final destination. But completely randomly, unrelated to any of this, at that final destination, there were about five cop cars and they were there responding to something just not even related to this case whatsoever. It was an absolute insane coincidence. But the kidnapper didn't know that and they just assumed, oh, you've called the cops. You've just done something I told you not to do. And so the kidnapper didn't get there. And so they had to make another attempt. They told the kidnapper, that was not us. We did not do that. We promise, which was true. The family would demand uh, to speak to Carrie. Like, we need to know she's alive. We need to know. And according to the family, Carrie did speak to them on the phone and kind of relayed the demands of the kidnapper. So the FBI were supposed to be recording all of these phone calls, but during a portion where Carrie was talking, they didn't hit record. And so it never recorded her voice. On September 13th, the kidnapper made a second attempt to get this money. It was now to be delivered at a service station just on the outskirts of Jasper, Alabama. So Earl gets to the payphone where it was demanded he go. He answers the phone and the guy on the other end says, I have a rifle aimed at you right now. And he says, do you see the house across the street? I believe presuming that's where he said or was trying to imply where he was located with a gun pointing at Earl Sr. But Earl left the money at the payphone as he was demanded to do, and then he drove away. So once everyone gets back to the house, they're expecting a phone call from the kidnapper to say, all right, I've got the money. I'm going to be releasing Carrie safely back into to, to you guys, but that call never came. So the FBI during this, these attempted drop-offs and now the finally the actual drop-off of the money, they put a little tracking device on Earl Sr.'s vehicle and they also put a tracking device in the briefcase where the money was. However, they made some kind of mistake because the beepers were transmitting on the exact same source or on the same frequency. So when they had air support who were supposed to be using this tracking device to follow where the money went, it was actually the helicopters ended up following one of the signals and it turns out they were following Earl in his vehicle. They weren't following the money because of the beepers were on the same frequency. They followed the wrong person. And at this point, they were losing hope. Like they were getting no phone calls anymore. They couldn't trace the phone number where the calls were coming from. They did have some recordings of the kidnapper's voice, but they, you know, they just were waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing ever came. So the community, along with the FBI, the police, the family, Carrie's friends, co-workers, they all began to search on foot. They searched all over Jasper. They searched in the miles and miles around Jasper. They were combing through the woods, looking in bodies of water. They were knocking on every single door, questioning as many people as they could. They were trying everything they could think of to find her kind of on their own, while also holding out hope that the kidnapper is going to call and say, all right, I'm finally releasing her. So the FBI would do something next where they would take the audio recordings of the kidnapper's voice and they would release them in hopes that people would recognize the voice. And actually, people did. Several people said that's that's the voice of a man named Jerry Bland. Jerry Bland had once, I guess, had a very thriving business in coal mining, but that business began to fail. And at this point in time, when the kidnapping occurred, he had hit very hard times and he was, he had no money. He was strapped for cash. Jerry's wife had recently left him. He had fallen into drugs like cocaine. It just, he his, he was on a, on a downward spiral. So the FBI, when kind of trying to find where Jerry Bland is, they are looking through all of his past associates, his family, and they come across the name of a woman named Karen Lancaster McPherson. She was Jerry Bland's cousin by marriage. And apparently Jerry and Karen were very close. They were really good friends. So police are able to find out where she is and they search her home. They get a warrant to search her house. 
They find thousands of dollars in cash and they she can't explain where it came from. And they also were questioning her and she actually would tell them what happened. She said that she was the woman posing as a nurse who called the Lawsons and made up the story about Earl Sr. having a heart attack. And she confirmed that it was Jerry Bland, her cousin by marriage, who actually orchestrated the kidnapping. He was the one to do the kidnapping, and he was the one making the phone calls. She also says that she watched over Carrie, I guess at this location where she was being held for at least a couple of days. The last time she actually saw Carrie alive was two days after the abduction, but then she said she never saw her after that. They had no idea why the why Carrie was targeted? They didn't know. They didn't know. The families didn't know each other. They didn't know of each other. They had no connections whatsoever, and they were just trying to find out why them. Like, why did you choose them? Well, apparently, a young boy found a cassette tape somewhere, and he turned that tape to his dad, who and the dad then in turn returned it to the authorities. On this tape were plans that were being spoken by a man, I believe, identified as Jerry Bland, as a plan to actually abduct someone else, a very wealthy business executive, a man in the coal enterprise named Ellis Taylor. But that was not the person they kidnapped. And they actually, there's another voice on that tape as well. They identified as Karen McPherson. So they knew that these two had planned a kidnapping with this intent of getting money because that's what he needed. Jerry needed money. He was broke and he needed money for drugs and whatever else he needed it for. But they don't know why it ended up turning to the Lawsons. They don't know. They've never been able to really establish that link or how they got their phone number or any of it. On September 28th, 1991, they were able to get a warrant. They found where Jerry Bland was staying. They found his house and they were given a warrant to search his home. There was no sign of Carrie there at all. He at at that point denied having anything to do with any of it. On his property, they had a, they found a truck and in that truck were like a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash. And because they had traced the serial numbers on the cash used in the ransom, they were able to definitively match that this was the ransom money. So Jerry Bland had the ransom money. For whatever reason, Jerry was not arrested then and there. I don't know why and I don't understand why. I mean, that's that's pretty damning evidence. You have, he has the ransom money. He took that money. You know he made the phone call. You have someone saying his, you know, cousin by marriage saying, yeah, he did this. We did this together. They didn't arrest him. So instead, the FBI staked out his house. They knew that he had in his house several guns, which they did not confiscate. They also found marijuana in his house, and that was another thing they could have done. They could have said, okay, we're gonna bust you for these drugs. There were so many reasons they could have arrested him for, but they didn't. The following Tuesday morning, uh, Jerry Bland, wife and his daughters, they had been seen observed by the FBI leaving the house. Shortly after 4.30 a.m., FBI agents would say they suddenly heard the sound of a gunshot, a single gunshot. When they entered the home, Jerry Bland was dead. There was a gun basically right next to him. There was no one else in the house. Jerry Bland committed suicide. Carrie's family and Earl and his family were sure, they were positive that they had uh, so much to arrest this guy the night prior, but they didn't do it. And they allowed him to stay in his home with guns, with other like, you know, drugs. They could have arrested him, but they didn't. And they could have, they could have arrested him. They would have been able to maybe hopefully get the information about where Carrie was. But all of that was lost once he pulled that trigger. A Washington Post reporter would end up writing a book about this case. And he basically said that this was one of the FBI's biggest failures. And then an FBI spokesperson at one point said, yeah, this definitely was not one of our, our shining moments. Karen McPherson was arrested and she was charged with kidnapping. They have questioned her many, many times and have asked her, where is Carrie? She either says she doesn't know where she is and maybe she's telling the truth or she knows where she is and she won't tell police. Either way, she's not telling them anything. There are some be who believe that Jerry and Karen may not have been the only ones involved here. This may have been a larger operation. But they don't really have proof of that. They have searched Jerry's home. Home. They have searched Karen's home. They have searched their properties. They have dug. They have gotten tips over the years about searching in certain like quarries or in like just pits in places. Search here in the woods. They brought equipment. They've dug up 
uh, the earth, they have searched, they have brought in cadaver dogs, the whole nine yards, they have brought in as whatever they can to find Carrie, but they have never been able to find her or any trace of her. Her social security number has never been used. It's not like she's out there somewhere. Karen McPherson would end up being convicted of the kidnapping portion of this, and she was sentenced to life in prison with the opportunity for parole. However, she has been up for parole, I think, a couple of times and has been denied every single time. I think a lot of that is because they don't feel like she's being completely truthful, that she might know where Carrie is, but she's not cooperating. She just won't say. Um, and if she does know, she won't say where she is. But there's also a chance she doesn't know where she is. The one person who definitely knew was Jerry Bland, but they allowed him to kill himself in his home. And with him, the, the, the end of this case disappeared just like carrie they don't know why it was her that they took they don't know why they were targeted they don't know where carrie is there's so much they don't know people have given tips about i well i killed carrie i killed carrie or i think this person killed carrie that person i know where she is she's here she's there but every single one of those tips and leads ended up being either just a hoax or it was false or it was just someone being an asshole because none of those tips and leads were actually truthful. And here we are now in 2024, Carrie Lawson has never been found and her family just wants her home. They want to be able to, I think everyone truly believes that she is deceased, that she was killed by Jerry, likely within a couple of days after the kidnapping, probably after he got the money. They just want her home. They want to find her so they can give her a proper burial and put her to rest. They want that closure. They want that answer. That's the one answer they want. They don't need to know the whys, the hows, the whos, the whats. They just need to know where she is and they just want to bring her home. But maybe there is someone out there who knows where she is. Maybe Jerry talked. Maybe Karen talked. Maybe Jerry's wife knows. Maybe somebody knows, right? Maybe there is possibly someone out there who might know where he put Carrie. And maybe that someone is you. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Carrie Lawson, you can contact your local FBI office or you can contact the Walker County Sheriff's Department at 205-302-6464 and maybe you can help finally bring Carrie home and help get her the justice that she rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, true crime, Aruni Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe if you are into true crime. I tell many, many true crime stories here. I have hundreds of videos on here. So please subscribe, give the video a like so more people can see it and maybe the right person will see this that can help get Carrie home. You know, you never know who might be out there who can help. I also tell short form true crime stories over on a couple different TikTok pages. The links to those TikTok pages is in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links to those TikToks also pop up here at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. So follow if you like. Also, I have a merch store. We That's also in the link tree below. We ship all over the entire world. I sell like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. Nothing super fancy or special, but we have it if you want to check it out. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below as well. Just send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened, and I'll add it to the list. The list is over 6,300 names long. I pick those cases I cover each time at random. So I can't promise you when I'll cover that case that you recommend, but I will get to it eventually. I swears it, I promises is it. Promises, is it? Whatever, Mike, shut up. Okay, that's nice. Right, mm-hmm. Anyway, what? <sighs> Drinking from my gay cup. This is how <clears throat> my little strokes have died. Okay, <laughs> this is how you uh, catch gay. Uh, it's liquefied into this special uh, gay uh, flavored cup and it's full of gayness from the top to the bottom and top and bottom get it gayness anyway um with every sip you get extra gay so to those of us who have been gay for a while this helps refill our gayness you know it's the gay liquid that's how it works so jesus made that happen i don't Yep. Okay.